Well, we left Paul in a jail in Philippi. And uh, we left him there under some unusual circumstances. You see, J Paul, had, Paul and Silas had been arrested because they were out preaching the gospel. And yet, as they were there at midnight in the stocks in this Philippian jail, freshly flogged and in bad shape, we find them singing praises to God in the midnight hour, and all the prisoners are listening in on them, singing. And as they're singing, this huge earthquake erupts, in which the prison's shaking, and then all of a sudden, the doors to all the prisoners fling open, and all the chains come off. Now, you would expect in that situation that you would just run as fast as you possibly could and hope you don't get caught. But something else happens in this situation. And it seems that Paul was thinking about an individual that perhaps the Holy Spirit was telling him needed to be reached in that place. You see, in that day, if a Roman jailer would have let his prisoners free, he would have been put to death. And there was a jailer that was there. And perhaps he had had some conversations, maybe not so pleasant, with Paul and Silas as he put them in the jail. But Paul seems to run over and find this guy just as he's about to kill himself. Because he knew that that would be his fate. He, he, I guess he figured he'd take matters into his own hands. And Paul says, no, wait, don't harm yourself. We're all still here. And for a jailer, that must have been absolutely unbelievable. Why would you all still be here? And so he runs up to see if it's true, and there they are. They're all sitting there, still at the jail. They've been set free by God, but they're still there in the jail. And he's so amazed that... It says, he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them, he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. And so now the question is, what happens after that? Well, they all still stayed in that prison, believe it or not. They stayed in the prison until morning. And when a letter showed up that said, I decree that you let this Paul and Silas go, but under a condition. You need to get out of town because you're causing trouble. And so from Philippi, and that made people upset. They didn't really want to see Paul go, and they thought that was unfair, especially since he's a Roman citizen. But so he goes on from Philippi, and where does he go but to Thessalonica? And we're told by Luke that Paul was there for a very short time, probably about a month. Because we find that he says that he went to the synagogue, as was his custom, and he reasoned with the Jews for three Sabbath days. And so three Saturdays, you could, you know, assume that he was probably there about a month. And so some people were coming to faith and they were believing. And so... Because he was there a month, we're going to call it Thessalonica instead of Thessalonica. And that'll help us remember a little bit. But after a month of this, there were some Jewish people that were in the synagogue, I'm sure, and they roused up this angry mob to go after Paul and to probably to hurt him, I would assume. And so they go, this angry mob goes to the house of a guy named Jason, the only time I appear in the Bible. <laughs> and apparently, the church was meeting at Jason's home, so they knew to go there. 
And so Jason, he, they grab him, and they're like, where are they? Well, they're not here. Okay, well, you come with us. And they drag him in front of this bit, you know, this angry mob erupts. And so basically, we don't want Paul and Silas here. They need to go. And so off they go after the angry mob kicks them out. Well, at least um, Paul goes. Well, actually, at this point, they all go. So scratch that. So, <laughs> so Paul and Silas and Timothy, they all go down to Berea. And we find this amazing thing said about the people in Berea. In Acts 17, 11, it says, Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Now, if you read the letter of the first Thessalonians, you would see that Paul thought very highly of the believers in Thessalonica. He doesn't really address a whole lot of problems, and we'll talk about that next week. He's more concerned with answering their questions. And he commends them for so many different things. And in fact, our, our motto for First, Thess First Thessalonians is going to be thriving church. And a couple of years ago, I think it was, we went through the whole book of First Thessalonians. And we took all of those things. And we looked at how to apply them to our church. So the Thessalonians, Paul thought very highly of. And yet he goes down to Berea. And he says, these guys are even better than the Thessalonians. And why? Because of their attitude towards the word and towards his message. Now, the, there's two sides to this that we see here. And it's the posture that every single one of us should take whenever we go, and especially in circumstances where you're, like right now, when you're listening to me tell you what the Bible says. Whenever you find yourself in that kind of situation, because you're not there directly with your Bible, and just you and the Holy Spirit, there's a go-between, and that'd be me. Now, hopefully, you can count on me that what I'm saying is what the Bible actually says. But it's not a foolproof system, and let's just admit that. So, whenever you find yourself in that situation, you need to remember the Bereans. And in fact, anytime I hand you an outline, I want you to write Acts 17.11 on it. Because it reminds you, that Luke is reminding you not to listen to anything I say. Not exactly. What they did is, as Paul was talking, it says they, they received the message with great eagerness. So they came expecting to hear from God. They came expecting to be challenged, expecting to learn something new. And they came with great eagerness. And I imagine that it was probably a more free setting than this, and their hands raising all over the place, and they're probably asking all sorts of questions as he's talking. But they received it with great eagerness, but they didn't stop there. This is what they did next. They went home, and every single day, they went back to what Paul was saying, and they read it for themselves. They checked it with other, other references in the Bible. And they asked themselves, well, that sounds great, but is it true? Is it really here? Is this really what the Bible says? Is Jesus really the Messiah? Is this whole thing a new covenant? Is, it, is all of these things that Paul is saying, is it really here? Or is it just something we got carried away with? And so they went back to the Bible and they studied it for themselves. <laughs> So those of you who have ever been to Berean Bookstore, now you know where they got the name. It's from when Paul was in Berea. And I guess the idea they're trying to communicate is that as a Christian, you should be studying the word. So that's the posture that all of us need to take whenever we find ourselves listening to somebody else 
talking about the Bible is that we need to search it out for ourselves. And so what happens in Berea is that the same angry mob in Thessalonica heard that Paul went down to Berea, which is right next door. And so they go, hey, let's go down there and cause trouble for him there too. And so there they come, down in Berea, angry mob, and Paul says, let's go on to the next place. So Paul, at this point, he goes down to Athens, but he sends Silas and Timothy back to Thessalonica. And he says, you check, you check in on those guys. We were only there a month. And these guys are impressive, but now they're facing persecution. They've been Christians for only a month. Let's go check and see how they're doing. And so Paul goes down to Athens, and he's essentially waiting for Silas and Timothy to show up while he's there. And so he's kind of wandering around the city. And Athens back then was a very impressive place. It was a place that you look around and you're just, wow. And what did he see? He would have seen the Parthenon. He would have seen countless, countless monuments to all sorts of gods. You know, Zeus, Hermes, the whole, the whole gamut was there. Now, as he's walking around and he's looking at these monuments, he sees one that catches his attention. And it says, to the unknown God. Now, apparently what happened, or at least what seems to happen, is that there was some, some instance, some, something that happened in which they couldn't necessarily ascribe it to any of their gods that they had. And so they wanted to thank this god, or maybe they just wanted to cover their bases and make sure that they had everything covered. And so they built this monument and said, to an unknown god. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and so Paul, this captures his attention. And so what he does is he finds this group known as the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was one of these groups that has a, a very comfortable life. Because basically, it says all that they do is they gather together and they talk about the latest ideas. That sounds like a real complicated life, right? So they would gather around and there were just like this think tank. And they would just gather and talk about what the latest ideas were. And so Paul, he finds these, guy, these guys on a place called Mars Hill. And he addresses them with the latest idea. And he starts out in talking about creation and the God who created all things. And then he starts quoting from their own Roman poets, which shows that Paul had a pretty good education in Roman things as well. And so he starts quoting from the Roman poets, and he's trying to show them that Jesus is the Savior who's died for their sins. And they were doing fine until he got to the part about the resurrection. And then they were like, wait, wait a minute. What did you just say? You're saying that a man named Jesus lived on this earth, he was crucified, and then he was dead for three days, and then he just got up and walked out of the tomb. Now, if we think about that, that sounds pretty silly, doesn't it? It sounds pretty silly outside of the context of Jesus actually being God, and there actually being a God who oversees all things, and Jesus actually being the Savior of the world who did die for our sins. Outside of that context, it sounds pretty silly to say a guy got up and walked out of the grave after three days. And so these deep thinkers didn't think too much of that. It says a couple of them asked if Paul would talk a little bit more on the subject, but most of them went, you're crazy. And they just walked off, and that was the end of it. Now, this story has become... Kind of a mantra for missionaries. And they go to this passage of Paul's address to the, the philosophers on Mars Hill, 
and then they go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul talks about, to the Jew I became a Jew, to the Greek I became a Greek, I became all things to all men so that I might save some. And the mantra of the missionary is that you need to go wherever it is you're going, but you need to leave your culture behind. Because if you go there and you're talking in English and you're wearing all the clothes that we would normally wear and you're doing all the cultural practice that that we would normally do, you're going to seem like an oddball to the people on the other side of the world. So what missionaries often do is they go, they learn the language, they learn the traditions, they learn the history, they learn the customs, they dress like the people do, they live where the people live so that they can learn how to preach the gospel in a way that would make sense to them. Now, here in the United States, we have the same kind of mentality growing up in many churches in which they're saying that we have a new generation, we have a new culture that's growing up in America, which, by the way, Missionaries don't necessarily have to go across the world anymore. The world is coming to us. And it's amazing to think that I can get on the internet and I can talk to somebody from across the world and the computer can do the translation for me and I can talk to them about the gospel without leaving my home. And in fact, now I can talk to them without leaving wherever I am. That's an amazing thing to really think about, how much the world has changed. And if we really realize that, that next door to us may be somebody who doesn't even speak English, next door to us may be somebody who does speak English, fully American citizen, but completely different culture. That means that every single one of us have become missionaries even in the sense that we usually think of missionaries. But that means that all of us need to think in the context of what Paul did on Mars Hill. Is we need to think, how does this message translate into their life? That doesn't mean we change the message. That doesn't mean that Jesus isn't crucified and for three days in the tomb and then rise from the dead, it means that we need to be thinking differently than we usually do when we're talking about things like reaching our family, our oikos. That means that some of them, we may need to stretch ourselves a little further. But there's some that I feel have taken what Paul did on Mars Hill and what he said about to the Jew I became a Jew, to the Greek I became a Greek, that they've taken it a tad too far. And would you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Now, this, this passage is relevant to this because Corinth was the very next place that Paul went after, after Athens. And here's what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And he says in verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 
Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the, the despised things, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. That are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Chapter 2. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence, or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. That was Paul's thoughts after he left Athens. And putting those two things together makes me think that something was going on with Paul. That he preached the gospel, but perhaps he felt like he wasn't completely relying upon God's spirit and upon God's message to be the power of that would reach the Areopagus. Perhaps he thought that he he started leaning on his own understanding, that it was the Roman poets who would be relevant to them, or it would be preaching in a philosophical way, which his address very much is, that it was that that was going to be the power by which he spoke. Now, I can't say that completely with with all authority because I'm kind of conjecturing as to why Paul went from Mars Hill to writing what he did in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. But it seems to me that we can talk about the need to be relevant, and it's true, And Paul even saw that need. But we need to be careful that we don't place our trust in our ability to be relevant. We need to be careful that we don't put our trust in how eloquent we can be with our speaking. Our trust needs to be completely in the Holy Spirit who is our power, and the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. But to those who are not being saved, we need to simply acknowledge it is utter rubbish and foolishness. And we need to honestly ask ourselves when we talk about reaching our oikos, reaching our household, reaching those who God has placed in our life. We need to be honest and really go before God and ask ourselves, are, what are we placing our trust in? When we pray for them, what are we really believing is going to happen? What do we really believe is God's will for the people in our family and for us? And I think that's something that Paul went through. That's a struggle he went through on Mars Hill. And it's a struggle that 
we need to go through. So God, Paul goes on after Silas and Timothy show up. He goes on to Corinth. And Corinth is a corrupt city. It was a city in which there was a port in which, which made it very popular in which all the ships would land that were going through the trade routes and they would land in Corinth and it's kind of like the stereotype of when you dock, when you get off the ship, when you've been gone for a long time, that's the, the reputation that Corinth had. That is kind of the Las Vegas, I guess you could say, in its reputation of that day. And Paul, we find that in Corinth, something different happens. He stays there for 18 months. Now, that must have been incredibly different for him after being rushed out of town after a month, after a few weeks, after a few months, and being chased by angry mobs and all sorts of different stuff. And the reason why he was able to stay for 18 months is because when he went into Corinth, the same thing started to happen. People tried to drag him before the proconsul, and there was a proconsul named Gallio. And Gallio... He hears the arguments, and here's what he basically says to them. He says, But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest. Next one. Okay. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, Settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. So what this meant, this decree was huge for Paul. Because what this decree meant was that he had freedom in Corinth to go and preach the gospel. He had the freedom to go with their blessing and say, if it's a matter of religious issues and a squabble between the Jews and Paul, I don't want to hear it. And so Paul was able to stay in, for 18 months in Corinth. Now, the other reason he was able to stay 18 months is because Paul was a tent maker. And because he was a tent maker, he, was able, he had a trade. He was able to take anywhere with him and make money and support himself apart from his support that he received from different churches. He was able to just go, and he met up with a, a pair who were also tent makers in Corinth named Aquila and Priscilla. And we'll hear more about them as Paul's journeys continue. So that is the second missionary journey of Paul. After Corinth, he stops by Ephesus, and then he goes back to Caesarea, and then back to his home church in Antioch. And he learned many lessons, planted in many churches, and faced persecution quite often. And that is really the same struggle that all of us will face. And so let us learn from the same lessons that Paul learned. Let us not be fearful of the same struggles that Paul faced. And let us see Paul and Silas and Timothy as an encouragement to us as we head out of these doors into our mission field. Amen.